Well then, Alistair. Well, 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 Mr. James Shakespeare. Welcome to the Lawmen Podcast Sports Almanac. The Lawmanac. The Lawmanac. The Lawmanac? Yeah, Lawmanac. Have you have you sneaked it out of the back pocket of a jock? I went all the way to Strickland's office mm-hmm. and I got it out of the bin and I flipped it open and it I'll tell you what, it wasn't what I expected. What? No, it was something different. It was Ooh la la. Uh, whoa. Ooh la la. <laughs> yeah. I can't remember exactly what it was, but I think it's a, a Switz Woo thing. It's a, some kind of cheesecake, they call it, don't they? Cheesecake is the name Do of those they? kind of um, pin-up drawings. I knew I them believe? as jazz mags. Well, ooh. I don't, and I don't know how rude that is. I think it's quite rude. I've always thought that if you were interested in jazz music, like people who read magazines about jazz must have a hell of a time buying them. Yes. Yeah. The same as, as parents whose kids are into the Australian TV show Bluey and want to buy the tie in Bluey magazine. <laughs> I want to buy some pornography from a Cockney in 1953. <laughs> yeah. That's going to be difficult. My two interests are occupying my kids who are fans of Australian cartoons and Jazz music. <laughs> News agent. <laughs> Why have you gone red? <laughs> what a festive intro to the podcast that was. Yes, it's it's another almanac edition, Alistair. We're recapping what has gone before. Is that what an almanac is? I thought an almanac was a book of predictions for the future. Yeah, I don't know, actually. So we called the episode an almanac without, without really knowing. But he who knows the past yep. uh, of a podcast, mm-hmm. they know the future of the podcast as well, don't they, really? <laughs> Are you saying it's getting predictable at this point? It's all podcasts are very much, um, they're a perennial, hardy vegetable. A podcast's a plant. I'm sorry, I'm reading the definition of almanac. <laughs> sorry, oh, thank that's, you. That's why you, uh, I left you hanging there. Mm. Um, is something to do with farmers? Yeah, I think that it, they're, um, it's a publication with information about what's going to happen, like weather and when to pa- plant crops and that sort of thing. For the next year. For the future year. But you're right, a sports almanac is about the past. So Yeah, exactly. But I suppose in Back to the Future, they too, they turn that on its head. It is both, yes. Yeah, they do. Well, whatever an almanac is... This is one of them. (laughs) It sounds to me like uh, we're using the word almanac, but what we really mean is clip show. Yes. All right, Alistair, keep it down. It's just a compilation show. It's like that episode where Riker goes into a coma, the next generation. Uh, Yeah? (laughs) Is it just a shot of his face? (laughs) It should have been. For 45 minutes or an hour plus with us. That would have been an improvement on the original episode. And you could just hear the other crew members sobbing around him and playing him. His, his favourite music and getting him his favourite magazines. Which was, what kind of music was that? It was jazz. Was it? Yeah. <laughs> I think William Riker would have woken up if he heard the rustling of jazz mags. You, hold on a second. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, on that <clears throat> horrible image, whichever one we keep in, um, Christmas pig to you, Alistair. Christmas pig to you and all of us. And uh, as a little sort of Christmas pig uh, warning, or a little t- t- teasing of the Christmas pig, uh, we're going to do a live stream on the 29th of <laughs> yeah, the, December. The teasing of the Christmas pig. Yes, 29th of December. Live stream, Christmas pig live. Christmas pig live. Join us, bring all your Christmas pig merch, you know, all the accoutrements. Your New Year's pig merch can come along because it's betwixt. Christmas and New Year. It's it's halfway between Christmas Pig and Plow Monday. <laughs> what else are you going to be doing? What is Plow Monday? I don't know. It's when they drag a big plow into church to get it blessed for the for the year or something like that. And really? I don't think I'm exaggerating. Plow Monday. You're saying it like it's a monster truck rally from the Simpsons. <laughs> plow, 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 plow Monday, Monday, it's Monday, Plow Monday, Monday, but, Monday. But no, this is. Um, this is the the Christmas pig look back. Well, Alistair, we asked the law folk on the law folk Discord for their highlights of the of the year, and they were 
very good at getting back to us on that, actually. Thanks. Thank Thanks, you. Folk. And we're going to play some clips from those because this is, it's not a clip show. Isn't it? It's an almanac. Oh, it's an almanac, yeah. You're going to hoist yourself by your own petard, Alistair. I, I do said, hate when that happens. You, <clears> I think you said, um, I'll never do a clip show. In fact, um, can we just play? James, I'll never do a clip show. That's a little joke where I say it was going to say that you said that you would never do a clip show and then I played the clip of it. But Oh, do you want me to say that so you can use that as a clip? Oh, yeah, go on. James, I'll never do a clip show. Yeah, see? Stop. What? I don't, what? what? <laughs> I don't remember saying that. Really? It just happened. Are we just going to start with the best and then work down? <laughs> I, don't know what's the, I don't know what's the best. I think we're going right. to have to do it um, in, not alphabetical, the other one, chronological order. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we'll start with the oldest and we'll end with the most recent, which will be that William Riker joke. And, and then eventually the the almanac just spirals round infinitely until yeah, we're quoting this, jokes from the start of this episode. This almanac is in the format of that snake from Greek myths. Ouroboros. Or Ouroboros, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I think I've done that joke every time or possibly, attempted to. Possibly. So what is the first, what's the first clip? It's from January 2022, Series 3, Episode 94. This was recommended by Fainissa and Ingrid, amongst others. And it was the very first episode of the year. The well of the Seven Heads. And this is a little particular highlight. Do you remember the exploits of Ranald McDonald? <laughs> <laughs> The year is 1663, mm. and the local bigwig in this area is the chief of the McDonald clan, Donald Glass, a.k.a. Grey Donald. Ooh. Everyone's got an a.k.a. here. Oh, good. From Gaelic to English and about five nicknames. If you get confused at any point, let me know. Okay. At the time that he died, his two young sons were being schooled overseas, and so these two boys, a couple of top lads, returned home to the house of Kepoch, where they lived. Their names were Alistair, mm -hmm. great name, and Ranald. 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 McDonald. <laughs> <It's not laughs> Is he in a just slightly off version of the, the Ronald McDonald outfit? Because he doesn't want to infringe on anyone's IP. Yeah, and, and their mate, Mocky Maus. <laughs> no, he's not Ranald McDonald. He's... Ranald McDonald, totally different. <laughs> I mean, it's obviously the same name as McDonald. <laughs> <laughs> How did I not notice that? So Alistair, a.k.a. Alexander. Huh? I'm sure I've mentioned on the podcast before, Alistair is the Gaelic version of Alexander. So if you read this story elsewhere, you might hear these people referred to as Alexander. Mm. And the Burger King. <laughs> <laughs> My name is like a knockoff of Burger King. <laughs> <laughs> Alistair Burger King. <laughs> oh, no. So he was due to become chief of the McDonald's when he reached maturity. When he got his five stars on his badge. I'm really <laughs> sorry, Scottish people. I don't know if you've ever heard this joke before. <laughs> there, there are loads of people called McDonald's. That's not just about the popular chain of restaurants. <laughs> Don't get too invested in this kid, is my advice to you at this point in the story, James. Okay. Final category, I'm not loving it. <laughs> uh, 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 uh. Like a sinister version of... Da -da -dun -dun -dun. <laughs> I'm not loving it. This was not a delicious tale of locally sourced meat or whatever it is they claim goes into it these days. I think they don't say locally sourced meat. They 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 give it, they could put a name on it at least, like beef. Oh yeah, yeah. Meat is too vague. <laughs> it's like when I was a student and we used to eat fruit jam. Oh. And you were like, what fruit? And the jam was like, don't ask questions. <laughs> Do you want jam or not? <laughs> I'm sweet, ain't I? <laughs> jam. Yeah, I mean, a lot of this tale made me do the name of the purple creature from the M McDonald's menagerie, Grimace. <laughs> <laughs> Weirdly, they phased out that one from being a, a mascot of the McDonald's company. Do you know that Grimace used to have four arms? What? He was an insect. Yep, Grimace used to have four arms and he was a villain who would steal milkshakes with all of his arms. <sighs> and then they got rid of two of his arms and made him a good guy. Oh. Yeah. I'm not loving that. So it was originally an insect I, then? Yes. It looks like a, like a tardigrade. Uh -huh. The little sort of um, tiny little water bear, the little microscopic creature. Oh. 
Oh. Just Google tardigrade. It looks like Grimace with four arms. I'm going to do it. I'm doing it live. Oh, they're small, aren't they? <laughs> Are you looking at an actual tardigrade? Oh, it's minuscule. Wow. Uh, that's going to haunt my nightmares. Yep. So that's a good fact for you. Grimace used to have four arms. Yes. I mean, this is the most McDonald's heavy mm-hmm. episode I think we've ever done. Without anybody actually being called McDonald. Ronald McDonald. <laughs> We even, I can't believe that we even had Officer Big Mac <laughs> involved in it. If you then told me that the the leader of the Civic Council in Gary was called Mayor McCheese. <laughs> well, it's a little brown badge with the name Alistair on it. Mm. And it's got five gold stars on that badge. Yes. Congratulations. Yes. You're off the chip counter. I'm moving on up. Baby. To the Iron Brew Dispenser, because they have Iron Brew Dispensers in Scottish McDonald's. You play your cards right, you'll be manager of this franchise one day. Thanks, James. We're still yet to be sued. Incredible, incredible that this hasn't registered on McDonald's radar. Mm. Now, looking at the list of highlights here, yes. I've heard a lot of talk about this one, and I have no recollection of it. The Peddler of Swaffham. I remember the Peddler of Swaffham. I remember you getting lost near a costa, but I do not remember anything about Big Pear. Oh, they've wiped your memory. Have they? <laughs> they've got to you. Am I a victim of Big Pear? Because I was, I, it, during the recording of the episode of The Peddler of Swaffham, I express uh, my distrust for the mealiness of the pear. Oh, well, I'm getting angry again now. This is a familiar sensation. Yes. And I think I think basically you were like, oh, the mealiness is a feature. That's one yes. of the selling points. The <laughs> yes, fact that the, 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 the inner stalk is, the core is sort of just melted into the whole thing and you don't know when to stop. Like with an apple, you know when to stop. <laughs> <laughs> no, a pear is like um, a, a water balloon full of porridge with a twig in it. It's delicious. <laughs> it could be a case of nominative determinism. Friend of the podcast, nominative determinism. <laughs> I'd keep it well away from that friend, that so-called friend. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that, James Shakeshaft? <laughs> no reason. Is it shake shaft or is it shakes? Shaft, do you think? Shakes haft. So you think it's shakes haft? It's the handle of a knife, axe, or spear. It's the same root as Shakespeare, and it is that of a pike man. It's not with Shakespeare. It's not he shakes a pear. No, no, that'd be absurd. The guy shook a spear. Oh, he shakes pear, wouldn't it? He shakes a pear. It's like, what, what are you, a, a lazy orchard <laughs> worker? Climb the tree and pick them. Don't just shake them. He's just trying to get across his anger at the texture of a pear. It's mealy mouthfeel. Oh, I like a pear. Oh, too mealy. I once had a bad day turned around just by having a pear at the right moment. What? I was really, really down and I just ate a pear. It was just one of the best pears I've ever eaten. And all the all the joy, it absorbed all of the sun's energy and it, all of the joy in the pair transferred directly to me. Hold on, hold on. Have you been bought, Alistair? Are you in the pocket of Big Pear? Big Pear. <laughs> yes, yeah. If, it's, if this is a sponsorship, we have to say on the podcast... This episode is brought to you by Pear. Big Pear. The conference pair. What's a conference pair? I, do, I think it's like a business pair. A, a business pair? That's the type of pair. One of the types of pair. It's the one with the sort of mucky coat. It looks like it's got mud on it sometimes. Mm. It's very matte finish. A pear is like a matte apple, I-M-H-O. You can get some matte apples, though, James. Mapples? There are matte apples. No, I want a jazz apple if I'm having an apple. <laughs> I want something that's out there zinging. Like the jazz apple or the pink lady. One of the ones that has a sort of a Soho vibe to it. Yeah. Oh, Granny Smith. She's a saucy granny. <laughs> <laughs> She's got bite. <laughs> Keep your apples in the fridge for extra zing. I, uh, well, I don't want to be too thrilling, but um, I have quite sensitive teeth because of the acid in an apple. Mm. I'm already taking a risk. So if that apple is refrigerated, uh, it's just too much of a risk for me to say. Oh, uh, sorry. Am I infringing on your pear deal at the minute? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, don't, I, can't, I mustn't uh, talk kindly of apples. I just gum down a pear <laughs> and it brightens my day. <laughs> 
I like pears. Come down a soft pear. Mm. I was down at Appletown. You're listening to Appletown, the podcast where James and I discussed in extraordinary detail the different qualities of fruits. Uh, the orchard fruits. It's just apples and pears. If only there were a, like a fun saying we could have used as the name of the podcast. Ah, if only we had a Cockney on who was just baffled. <laughs> <laughs> I think this has been one of the most to-the-point intros we've ever done. Yeah. Ready proof of proof we need be. But I stand by my defence of the delicious fruit that is called pear. I, yeah, you do. And you sort of, you whack it in your hand like a kosh. <laughs> yeah, Whenever anyone starts. Plap, plap, plap. <laughs> that's the sound it makes. Yeah, that's the sound of the conference pear. If I rotate it, like a, like a, like a pestle and mortar, the slightly coarse surface grinds uh, against my skin. Gross. Ooh, I, You're ooh, supposed like to eat that. You're supposed to eat that brown. Yes. If you enjoyed the uh, the peddler of Swaffham, but there is also a field report from when I went to Swaffham uh, to try and find the statue or the effigy of the peddler and was led a merry dance by the residents of Swaffham. I don't know if it was intentional or not, but they, they really played me like a pair of bagpipes. Is it a pair of bagpipes? That was an unintentional pair pun. A big pair. Big pair of bagpipes. <laughs> squidge. Squidge. Yeah, I have to be honest, of all the fruits, that's the one that's most like bagpipes to me. Anyway. That's fair. We, we need to move on. You know, the next episode that is recommended as a highlight by the law folk is the next episode of the year. This is three for three so far. Wow. The first three proper episodes it of the really year. It really went downhill after... Yes! How long can that go on for? I'll, we'll find out. But this next one is from Yorkshire Dragons. Yorkshire Dragons. Is that the one that was all about parking? Aye, I think it was one of those. Yorkshire Dragons. Yeah. There was a bit of a Ruth L. Tunkerfuffle. I think I had to make some... The Tunkerfuffle, yeah. Yeah. The Great Tunkerfuffle. Of 2022. Now, laying my cards on the table, this is a Yorkshire folktale recorded, supposedly, from a Somerset stable by none other than Ruth the Tongue. Ruth the Tongue. Yes. Who, as we discovered in a recent podcast, is not regarded as a particularly reliable source. And it's interesting that this story doesn't appear in the 1888 book of Yorkshire Dragons that I mentioned earlier. Um, cool. Last time we took the tongue's name in vain, <laughs> there were repercussions. <laughs> we also got a really annoying review, which I think is one of the tongue's cohorts leaving. It was a three star Ugh. and it said, and this isn't, a, this is by no means a call to arms for a pile on. It's annoying. They bleep swears. We're all grown ups. If we weren't, bleeping swears and you were re- listening to this while having your breakfast that bit earlier would have made you put your spoon down and put your breakfast away <laughs> <laughs> it's disgusting it absolutely you don't I think the listeners don't know what he was kicked in it's awful mm, or what happened <laughs> or what happened after he was kicked in it yes although if they knew the first they might be able to deduce the second yeah to be honest yeah 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 it's, it's, it is very much a cause and effect okay so this comes from the tongue <sighs> but I have one reason why I think it is not an invention from the brain of Ruth. Yeah. I'll, I'll present that when the time comes. Well, yeah, that's the thing. I don't think I don't think anyone's saying that all her stuff was just completely made up. It's just that she doesn't cite sources and and some of the stuff is just remembered from stories that she heard when she was a kid. Like, to be honest, we are very much in glass houses. I am very much in a glass house <laughs> right now. <laughs> You're not throwing stones, are you, James? I've got a whole bag of stones right here. Ooh! I don't know why. I just long to lob them, but I I really mustn't. I don't think people who live in any house should throw stones within their house, to be honest. Don't throw a stone in the house. Yeah. The tellies, mirrors. Yeah. Pitch frames. Other people. Uh, sometimes you might have a vase on one of those stands that's just a stand for a vase. You never see one of those. Unless the vase falls off, mm, that's brought back a real embarrassing memory of mine. Have you broke? Did you did you break a Ming vase as a child? No, I broke a little occasional table, which was, it was no longer a table <laughs> at any point after I was done with it. Temporary table would have been more accurate if they had known what was coming. It looked like a stool. Mm. 
but it wasn't. It was a very delicate table. You sat on it as an overly large child. As a standard, no, I was. I'm a, I'm a two portion man. We all know this. As a beefy child, <laughs> not even a child. As a teen. Oh, beefy teen shake shaft comes in, sitting on your tables. And it, oh no, I'm sorry. And they get out of here, you horrible giants. Chase to the hills. <laughs> and I bump my head on the door on the way out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. All the villagers getting pitchforks and flaming torches. But fortunately, I could get away because of my long legs. <laughs> Just loping off into the hills. They've been given. And this table that was their legs were all sort of intertwined, but all carved from one piece of wood. Oh. But they were sort of carved in such a way that like you you had to carve it, you couldn't make it. So there was like mm. they sort of went through each other kind of thing. Yeah. And I just sat on it. Boom. Straight away. Get away. <laughs> Nothing. Really. <laughs> to be honest, it's a bad way of making a table. <laughs> yeah, if it can't support the weight of a, of a well-fed teen. A minimum 12 stones. <laughs> a 12 stone teen? Mm. What would that be in kilos for our European listeners? Or just straight up LBs. A 168 pound teen? Lad. Tall teen? Yeah. Carried it well. Or a 76 kilo boy? I can see why you felt guilty about oh, that. Thank you really for sharing bad. that story. Yeah, sorry. Thank you for Ruth L. Tunging that vague childhood yeah. memory. I mean, it definitely happened because I, d- I regularly remember it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Jenny Collier episode next. Yeah, and again, the very next episode, we were what? we were just chucking up rocks. I don't. I'm starting to think this is unscientific, but I just don't believe that the best episodes of the year all happened in a row, starting with the first one. I don't, this isn't, again, this isn't in any sort of like hierarchy apart from chronology, 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 yep. Yep. chronology, but boy, were we popular in winter. <laughs> <laughs> it's, that's, I think, when we're at our best, when yeah. it's cold outside. But this was a return of Jenny Collier because it was the Valentine's Day special. Of course. The dream of Max and Vledig. I think it's Vledig, isn't it? Not Vledig. He said it in a German voice. I also do. A, there's also a sequel to this episode where I do the same pronunciation. <laughs> <laughs> the lad's garments were of pure black brocaded silk, mm. frontlets of ruddy gold <sighs> holding their hair in place. Whereupon were sparkling jewels of great price, rubies and gems. They're playing a board game and they're dressed up like that. I, it's like it feels like Christmas Day, you know, when you've got your your present, you've been given a present, <laughs> and you're like, "Well, I better wear it." Yes. And so they're like wearing their all their Christmas jewels. They're wearing buskins of new cardovan leather, which I don't know what that means, but it sounds like Freeman Hardy Willis of the <laughs> 800 ADs. I looked it up. Cordovan leather oh, yeah. is horse leather, oh, right. specifically from the bum. <laughs> oh, you can see what... It's horse bum leather. And you can see they, yeah, they rebadged it. They didn't call it HBL, horse bum leather. <laughs> <laughs> Got that new horse bum smell. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's what they were wearing on their feet, with bands of mm. red gold fastening them. So they were like the um, medieval Manolo Blahniks. Because they're famously red, aren't they? I don't, I don't Black know. Is that shoes? I don't know. Oh, look at me pretending to know about fashion because I once <laughs> saw Sex in the City in like, 2002. <laughs> Jimmy Choo. Sorry, I just thought of a name of a fancy shoe man. But it, like, we've got used to the fact that he makes shoes and he's called Jimmy Choo. I think he should make trains. <laughs> 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 so in this fair, fair hall... Beside a pillar, he sees a hoary-headed man in a mm. chair of ivory with two gold eagles thereon. Fairly tasteful by comparison with the rest of the room. Well, <laughs> he's covered in bracelets and rings and a golden diadem and a talk. So he's wearing his Christmas Day jewellery as well. <laughs> he's just done the cracker, though. <laughs> wearing his Christmas Day jewellery has a little bit of an in-his-birthday-suit kind of feel. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was wearing his Christmas Day jewellery. Do your robes up, King. We can see your Christmas Day jewellery. <laughs> Five gold rings. <laughs> I could have said pimp gold rings. Oh. And what have we got here? Is this a live episode? I, hold on, this is the next episode. Is this, this next again, episode boom, again? Bang. Next episode, 17th of February. Episode. 
The, the Curse, curse of, of the, the Silk, silk shoes. shoes. This was a, not only was this live, the, live streamed, this was live lived. Yeah, the, the meaning of live. We lived In it. Leicester. Yes, the Leicester Comedy Festival, right? The Comedy Leicester. To which we will be returning this very February 2023. 2023. I think I can see why the law folk voted for this one. Yeah. Yeah. It's the bit where they really helped us out because I couldn't remember that there would be a law folk law based word beginning with P when it came to scoring. And they reminded me of, obviously, pimp. Of course. Pimp. There were a lot of plosives in this episode. Yes. Thank goodness for those pop shields. We have the category of plosives. Plosives. What if someone isn't as clued up on word terminology? What is a plosive sound, James? A plosive sound. A plosive sound. It's a P. A Plosive sound. It's a P or a B. That's about it, I think, isn't it? P, B. Yeah, it's one of the ones where you shoot pl- plosive. You shoot some air it's, straight out of your mouth into a microphone, causing bassy problems. Yes, it's where you have sealed your lips and then you release that seal in an explosion. We've got pamps. We've got pamps. We've got papillon. papillon. Papillon, that's two. We've got Len Beanie. 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 Beanie Belleville. And pamps. Thomas Holford, no. <laughs> We got George Bosworth. Nice. Who bequeathed the shoes. Yes. The bequeathed slippers. Oh. We've got all of these and no more. <laughs> it's pende, which I think is the Greek word for five. Oh, yes. And it's the only P5 I could think of. Pimp. 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 <laughs> My God, pimp, of course. <laughs> I'm so glad we created an environment where someone can just say, <laughs> with a questioning voice, pimp. <laughs> And for everyone else to go, yes, yes of course, <laughs> pimp. <laughs> and finally, of course. And now, James, this is, yeah, I don't, this is going to shock the listener. Go on. The next selection is from the very next episode of the year. Oh, what, 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 what? I sort of think maybe the 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 law folk just looked at a list of the episodes of the year. Yeah, from January and uh, and chose all of them. They just went, oh, look oh, Look at the first six, and then um, we'll tail off after that. Yeah. So what, this is the sixth in a row? Yes. Oh, it's a double hat trick. However, it was one of my episodes, so we'll accept it. Ooh. It was, it was Talking the, Heads, it was not talking the band. Heads, not the band. This was also live-streamed. It was live-streamed. And it featured an image which I was <laughs> so taken aback by. Yep. I, it's re- it genuinely throws me off in the live stream that I can't, because I can't think of ways to describe it that I, is not um, actionable. I deliberately made sure you didn't see it until the live stream, because I thought I, I wanted to see. I wanted to see the impact. Yeah, re- and then I really did see it. I was singing oh, a Christmas uh, Carol in the style of the mm, flesh tube. <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh, <laughs> friendly. <laughs> Ever so friendly. The professor, with a slight German accent, he's actually from Austria, put his wonderful toy in motion. It was not necessary to prove the absence of deception. One keyboard touched by the professor... Produce words which slowly and deliberately, in a hoarse, sepulchral voice, came from the mouth of the figure, as if from the depths of a tomb. It wanted little imagination to make the very few visitors believe that the figure contained an imprisoned human, or half-human being, bound to speak slowly when tormented by the unseen power outside. Oh, no! No one thought for a moment that they were being fooled by a second edition of the Invisible Girl fraud. What was the Invisible Girl fraud first edition? Well, there's a couple of frauds, uh, and I wonder if uh, listeners might have um, already been thinking of uh, von Kempelen's automaton in a similar Turkish Middle Eastern Mm. dress who appeared to be able to play chess, but was actually a little person in a box controlling a puppet. Uh, that, that fooled everyone for a bit. Yeah. The invisible girl was a, an orb suspended in the middle of the room which could answer questions put to it 
by the audience. Oh. Essentially, it was a ventriloquism act. Uh, it was quickly exposed. Ah. But for a while, it had people taken in. Ah. What's less famous is that von Kempelen also made a precursor to this very talking machine. So just on the chess thing, do you think when they sort of came up with that scam, they were like, we need to, it needs to play chess. That's part of the thing. Or was it like when you get a comedian that can play the guitar, (laughs) they just start doing it just because they can do it anyway. I guess the guy in the box, he had to be good at chess. Otherwise the whole thing didn't work. I'm I'm really doing this to get exposure and and to become a chess master, a grandmaster of chess. (laughs) This is the only way in. You've got to have a, you've got to have a gimmick. Von Kempelen, as well as making that fraud, also created a talking machine. What's remarkable is that this machine worked at all, and it has been reconstructed by YouTuber Fabian Brackhain. Mm. So let's listen to the sound of it now. Sure. This is uh, Von Kempelen's talking machine. Not expecting anything creepy. Whoa. I don't know if you can see, James, the words I'm no ventriloquist are appearing on the screen, reassuring you. You don't need to with this video editing. You just, you know, touch a wooden box and then play over the sound of a sheep being kicked. (laughs) (laughs) It does. It really sounds like a duck. (laughs) You'll see in a second why I haven't stopped what's happening, why I haven't intervened. Oh, he's tickled it. (laughs) Oh, it's like that goat that shouted Frank that time. My favourite part of that video is the bit where the graphic says, but how does it work? Rather than the more pertinent question, does it work? (laughs) Is that speech or... Uh, why, if you had to create like a, a creepy automaton, why would you have it say only the words "mama" and "papa"? Like, like yeah. it's, being, it's being tortured into life. Well, yeah, maybe they, maybe he didn't have a choice. Maybe he made it, and that is what <laughs> it said. Or you saw how a baby works because you get a baby and they yeah. start off with "mama" and "papa," and then they, it kind of builds from there. So maybe they hope uh, he reasonably assumed that it would learn other words after that. Yeah. But it stayed forever in a revolting state of um, essentially a duck in a box. Oh, and that, that live stream, if you do check out the live stream, which is archived on that YouTube. On YouTube. YouTube.com forward slash Law Men Podcast. Neil Iron pops up the very same. Neil Iron. Neil yeah. Iron. I, no, it's Iron. Spelled I R O N because he's made of metal in this episode. No, it's I O N. Oh, because he had a, in, he was in a metal In this episode, head. he's made of metal. It's a pun. That's a good pun. He's currently the voice, when I read the cat in the hat to my children, Neil Ion is the voice of the fish. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Then. I do not like it. He should not be here when your mother is out. Yeah. It's a, it's a real fun one to play with. Yeah. The next highlight was st- oh, sh- the internet's own Sean Burke. Uh, with the... <laughs> um, I think this... The comment in the Discord, uh, one of the highlights of this episode was Irish farmer ham radio Jerry Seinfeld. (laughs) This is just a series of incoherent words. Yes. Irish farmer ham radio Jerry Seinfeld. I've got a faint sense that that rings a bell, but I don't remember what it was. Although you've also given us our best review of the podcast. It's just a string of incoherent words. (laughs) Five stars, please. (laughs) Who, by the way, has ever heard of badgers attacking sheep? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Who, by the way, has ever heard of a badger attacking a sheep? Like, it's a great question. I assume whatever's the Irish equivalent of LBC has people ringing in and asking <laughs> questions like that all the time. Yeah, call in. Let us know. Have you seen a badger attack a sheep? Is it, it's, has uh, anyone, it's, by the way, ever heard of a badger attacking a sheep? <laughs> it's like... A, Irish farmer Jerry Seinfeld. <laughs> <laughs> Has anybody actually seen a badger attack a sheep? I mean, come on. The way it's phrased, it's so like, is that a rhetorical question, John? Are you genuinely asking? <laughs> no, seriously. And like, when he talks about them being careful climbers, I'm like, right, so they have all the correct equipment. <laughs> yeah. They've got a harness. They've got a sheep down at the bottom holding on to their rope. Yeah. You know, they've thought of everything. Careful, such a lovely word. You can see him going past, like, "Are you being careful in there?" And the sheep <laughs> nodding. <laughs> yes, I know the area. <laughs> so the, the sheep has also got the same voice as John Madden. 
and, mm-hmm. and a 15-year-old boy. When he's mm-hmm. saying, have you ever heard of a badger attacking a sheep? He's saying that that couldn't happen. He's not being like Quinn mm-hmm. from Jaws, being like, you ever seen a badger attack a sheep? <laughs> <laughs> he's not like, trying to scare you. The badger's eye is black. <laughs> like a doll's eye. You ever seen the head of a badger? <laughs> Stripes like a zebra crossing. <laughs> James, explosive, explosive news about mm-hmm. that clip you just played. What? What you were listening to there was a fabrication. Hmm? Tissue well, of lies? It was, it was indeed a tissue of lies. It was a full handkerchief of untruths. Uh-huh. Uh, I think I bet, I, well, I, expl- I confessed, but only the people on the Patreon ever heard. So I guess I better put it in my own words. If you can. <laughs> Unbeknownst to you, me, I accidentally recorded the episode using the wrong microphone, a classic oh, lawmen you- error that we've made many times before. I'm, I, and I was very annoyed because it was it was 2 1 to you. You'd done it twice. Yep. I'd done it once. Yeah. And I was king of the podcast. And then I did it. So I was really unhappy about your equalizer. So what I did, like a nerd, mm is I re-recorded my entire dialogue for the whole episode. What? Yeah. Have you? I don't think you'll notice. But the, but when you come and listen to the to the extras, nowhere am I re-recording my dialogue for the extras. No, no. So I'm going to sound like I'm in a well again. Down a well. So don't, please, people in the Patreon, don't spoil the illusion that I, that my banter and, and uh, is actually fake banter. <laughs> So there you go. I wasn't even in that episode. But so what did you, what did you, but so you did that impression a second time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is the next episode, the next episode again? Yeah. The Wells of St. Wolston, Norfolk, episode 102 of series three dropped. It dropped on the 31st of March. That's my birthday. Is it? Yeah. Happy birthday. Thank you. I mean, for, for then. then. For then, yeah. I didn't say that. Well, this was a live stream, so we would have recorded it the previous week, yes, which is why it. I didn't say a word. Now, I've been hearing a lot about David Lynch the cow, and I have no real memory of David Lynch the cow. Well... What was that? Is this the episode that Let the Cows Decide comes from? Yeah, so this was a live stream, and it somehow, once again, much like Christmas Pig, I don't know how it happened, but the words Let the Cows Decide... <laughs> Got involved <laughs> and they stuck around. Right. Yeah. And how is David Lynch involved? I think you. Well, let's have a listen. I, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And final category. Thank you very much to the chat for this one. Let the cows decide. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, right. Do you want to explain the category at all? Um, chat. Wait, no. C- Come here. <laughs> right, the chat is just people shouting, let, let the cows decide. They're just saying it again. You're just saying it again. I think clearly you've created something, James, but I'm not sure. Maybe we should let the cows decide. That you know what it is. Everyone's saying let the cows decide in the Twitch chat. The the, the YouTube chat has not yet succumbed. I, in the YouTube chat, I can see at least one person complimenting us on how much work we must put into the edits of these to take all this <laughs> nonsense out. <laughs> but and to be fair, normally people aren't just heckling with the words let the cows decide. All right, hold on. Hello, listener. At this point in the proceedings, in a state of borderline delirium, I combined some fake plastic cow's horns with model's own ginger hair to create a perfect facsimile of a Highland cow, while James entertained the listeners by reading from On the Farm, I Spy with David Bellamy. If this isn't making sense, you can go to youtube.com forward slash lawmen podcast and watch the whole live stream, and it will still not really make sense. For the purposes of the podcast, here is how James reacted to my cow disguise. <laughs> there you go. Hello, hello, James. It's me. I'm a Scottish cow. I've just uh, popped in from the old uh, outdoors there to... People are asking for me to add in David Lynch to the accent. Um, <laughs> hello, James. It's me, David Lynch, also a cow. <laughs> just popped in to do the scores for this category. Uh, David Lynch, 
Cow. Yes. Um, what? Are you a are you a form of Highland cattle? Uh, yes. They, um, I'll feel this one, David. <laughs> My Highland cow because I've got ginger hair. You've got long hair and long horns. That's a score of twenty five from Bellamy. From David Bellamy's on the farm, I spy on the farm book. Yeah, James. I think it was mm. a strong, a strong entry, and it's five out of five for me. Thank you. Uh, David, are you yes. in agreement? Yes, I agree. It's a <laughs> solid five out of five. And uh, and what do you think, South African cow? It's uh, five out of five for uh, Let the Cows Decide. <laughs> nice one, the cows. We're jumping ahead now to May. Yes. So we did some bad episodes. A few episodes. We must have Just done a bit it. of filler there. And then this is actually the last the last episode of Series 3. It was a good one. I, I could tell you'd put a lot of effort into researching it. I, I read a book, not a booklet. Not a, not a pamphlet. No, a, a pamph. pamph. <laughs> yeah. How many times do you think we've said that joke? Because <laughs> I'm pretty certain we said that joke in Series 1. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd say, well, depending on the amount of episodes per series, um, <laughs> probably about four times. A series. Can't believe you read a whole pamph. It's a big pamph action. William Adams, the first Englishman in Japan. They yes. killed all those penguins. They, they killed did. way too many penguins. It was awful. Only the other day, uh, one of my children asked me if people ate penguins. And I said, ah, oh, no, I imagine they taste disgusting. And then, was, you know, when you got a little itch in your mind of like, is a, why is it people eating penguins? <laughs> Ring a bell, and it was like, oh, but there was this time when these sailors <laughs> ate like a thousand. <laughs> the end of March, they'd reached Argentina. It took them three months to get across, mm. and they wanted to drop anchor immediately, but the, the wind was going in the right direction for them, so they pushed on to the Straits of Magellan. Now, these are a pretty... Di- they're at the very tip. There's like a bunch of islands off the very tip of South America, and there's a way through, but it's quite hard to find. And they managed to get through, and then they saw an island full of penguins, uh, which, according to Adams, he gives them some context. Penguins, which are fowls greater than a duck. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't how I don't hold that much hope for the penguins in this story. No, um, I think they're going to eat those penguins. Yeah, they within minutes they'd club to death more than fourteen hundred of them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I'm laughing at that. I think it's that they managed it within minutes. Fourteen hundred. <laughs> yeah, you've killed, that's more penguins. Than, I know you were hungry. Yes. Sometimes when you, you shouldn't shop when you're hungry, you shouldn't club penguins when you've got scurvy. Yeah. You should club a penguin, eat a penguin, then see how you feel. Give it twenty minutes. Yeah, fourteen hundred penguins. The image there is a there's a um, fourteen hundred image of it, and it sort of shows in the in the foreground a penguin looking morosely off into the distance, and in the background there's like sailors <laughs> just smashing penguins to pieces. <laughs> a single sad penguin. Well, that is a really sad story of loads of penguins dying. It was winter now down there. One of the ships lost the anchor. When the cable snapped in a storm, a thick sea mist descending on the fleet, and that slowed them down. They were basically trapped in uh, what uh, one of the crew members, DeVitt, uh, wrote as a perpetual stormy winter. And he just wrote a list of grievances. Rain, wind, snow, hail, hunger, losses of anchors, spoils of ship and tackling, sickness, death, want of store, and store of wants conspired to fullness of miseries. Well, you only lost one anchor, so stop exaggerating. Losses of anchor. I like that want of store and store of wants. That's good. Yeah, yeah, a gift. He had a gift for the gripe. I'd like to hear this guy writing into Anne Robinson's watchdog in the 90s. (laughs) (laughs) Round these parts, the locals didn't like visitors very much. A group rode out to their fleet and they just threw rocks at the boat, shouted abuse and rode away again. <laughs> Good. So they rode Good. out, threw rocks at the men. How do, did they speak the language? How do we know we weren't saying, welcome, here are some rocks for you? <laughs> <laughs> I hope you like the rocks. <laughs> <laughs> this is my favourite rock. <laughs> here, free rocks. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, morale was at a low. So this is worse than the earlier bit where like sixteen guys died. Wow! Simon the Cords tr- tried to raise morale with a little pageantry. He, he like made a club, made his captains knights of this guild, and he called it the Order of the Furious Lions. <laughs> this sounds 
so annoying. No, this is like the the No Monster Club. Not all your problems can be solved by forming a club. <laughs> they they rode ashore with like trumpets going off, and they uh, put a big pillar up, and they put a plaque with the names of all the knights on it at the bottom, and he ordered that the dead be buried at the foot of the pillar. You know, light stuff. Light fun. Yeah, light-hearted fun, yeah. Um, and then they went back to the boat, really chuffed with themselves, and then the locals smashed the monument to pieces, <laughs> dug up the corpses and pulled <laughs> them to pieces in front of them. <laughs> and apparently the body of Simon de Cord's barb was particularly badly mutilated. Um if they pulled his willy off. <laughs> oh, no. mm. That's our first, that was our first two-parter. Is that the end of part one of the Almanac? Yes. And much like series the and much like the series three that we've been recapping so far. Let's end on a on a cliffhanger. Yeah, all right. What's gonna be next? More great episodes? With a single bound, James Fakeshaft was free. That was the, the classic uh, way they used to resolve cliffhangers. In, By uh, jumping. In Pulp Fiction. No, because like they'd always end up with the guy tied up next to TNT. And they were mm-hmm. like, how's he going to get out of this situation? And then the cliche is, in the start of the next episode, rather than resolving it, they would just say, in a single bound, he was free. He just did. Yeah, he just did. <laughs> How'd he get free? He just did. In a single bound. Oh, a single bound? Yeah, not, not, not a multiple of, bound. Across a, series of, across a series of multiple bounds, he was free. All right, well... um, We'll see you next week. Christmas pig in the meantime. Christmas pig. Uh, see you next week for for some more. Great. Just bits of us being great. Oh, tiding of God, <laughs> Jesus Christ. I don't know what song starts like that, but um, <laughs> it's what I imagine that thing saying. <laughs>